My name is Tim Mackey and I'm a Senior Scientific Officer with the Marine Monitoring and Assessment Team of DARA's Marine Division. I'm also a member of the Scientific Diving Team that helps monitor the marine environments around Northern Ireland. Here you can see the cameras and comm systems that we use to help us in this task. Strangford is a fully enclosed marine body of water with multiple designations as a marine protected area. The dives we're looking at today happened in the Narrows at the southern end of the loch where there are stronger currents than the rest of the water body. The dive team dive under HSE commercial diving at work regulations and as a result we have to use some reasonably complex kit to make sure that we're kept safe. On this dive we've gone down a mooring chain onto seagrass beds to have a look at the impact of the swinging chain on that seagrass bed. Here you can see the riser going up to the surface buoy about five or six metres above us. We can use other methods of assessing the impact as well. Here we've used a side scan sonar system and you can see the, the bald patch in the middle um, alongside. Here you can also see the edge of a seagrass bed, pretty well defined. So we can map out using side scan sonar the areas of seagrass bed. Underwater we can take pictures using small cameras. In amongst the seagrass we also have non-native seaweed here, Sargassum muticum, one of about 25 recorded non-native species from the loch. The department is looking at the potential for using uh, seagrass friendly moorings that have less impact, less damaging impact on the seagrass beds. It just happens that seagrass likes sheltered soft bottom shallow water environments to grow in ideal for when you're anchoring your boat. Seagrass is also called eelgrass and is unlike a seaweed, a true flowering plant. Actually it's more closely related to lilies and orchids than it is grass. Seagrass meadows around our shores are under pressure from, well, pollution through increasing nutrients that make some of the other competing seaweeds outgrow them. They're also susceptible to sedimentation, which decreases the amount of light available to them. Meadows provide ecological services to a range of animals, small fish that use them for habitat and nursery cover, small animals that, that graze on them. The roots penetrate deep into the soft sediments through their rhizome systems and that helps stabilize the mud that would otherwise maybe be washed away and helps attenuate storm energy that would otherwise reach the coast and cause additional erosion. Seagrasses are recognized as being major sequesters of blue carbon, organic carbon from both the atmosphere and the surrounding water and have a recognized role in the mitigation of climate change. Here we have little resort snails feeding merrily on the apifauna on the blades. Here, for those of you who like a pun or like your trivia, this is a cowrie. Its Latin name is Trivia. We have two species of cowrie, the European or spotted cowrie, as well as the northern cowrie. A spotted cowrie's shell bears two or three spots on it. That's not what you were seeing there. Those spots were on the mantle. In amongst the seagrass, we have some saccharina or sugar kelp, as well as the occasional bit of cordweed. It's all recorded for posterity. Here again you can see a patch that 
smacks of physical disturbance. Something has rubbed the seagrass off this area. And not surprisingly, there's another mooring in evidence. Moving down the slope into deeper water and on the kelp, we can find animals such as this, a sea slug or nudibranch, Edmund Zella in this case. Here, a spindly spider crab. And one of the favourites, a bloody Henry starfish. These come in lots of different colour morphs, from purple to bright orange, and everything in between. A small dragonette. And overhead you can hear the props from the boat. It's hopefully doing our safety cover. A harbour crab. Having a forage for worms or whatever it can find. Different to a shore crab in that rather than having pointy back legs, it's got paddly legs, which can propel it at quite some speed. So when disturbed, like then, it scuttles well out of the way. Common starfish, deriving their name from the Greek for star, aster, so Asterius rubens. And here, solitary sea squirts. Acidiella, a long arm squat lobster, making a meal of a bit of jellyfish it's found. And light bulb sea squirts, Clavulina. Fish are always tricky, especially when they dart across your path like this. A flounder, I'm saying. And again, in amongst the sea squirts, the feather stars. You can just see the arms of some black little stars. Butterfish most people are familiar with from their hunts on the shore. Turn over rocks in the intertidal and you'll quite often find them. Of course, not all starfish have just five arms. Here, the common sun star, Crossaster, has 10 to 12. The velvet swimming crab, with its bright red eyes and aggressive attitude underwater, has earned it the reputation and nickname of the devil crab. In amongst the Acidiella, a painted top shell, in this case an unpainted one in its white morph, and sea beard. Colonial hydroid, Nematesia. Always a good place to look out for feeding nudibranchs, or at least their egg mass, which is quite often, quite often more of a giveaway. Here, a candy-striped flatworm. Not a true segmented worm, but a member of the platyhelminthes. More recognisable to most would be the edible or brown crab, in this case a big male with his claws held aloft ready to defend himself. At the base of these sea squirts, tube dwelling anemones, Edwardsia. And here, snuggled amongst them, a Yarrow's Blenny. From the front, peeking out, you can see his little fringed tentacle. This spider crab has attached bright orange sponge all over its body. It breaks up its outline and probably makes it less appealing to predators. The egg mass of another nudibranch, Pleurobranchus, forms a spiral and is attached to the bottom, wafting in the current, earning itself the name of the Highland Dancer. And on top, another nudibranch, grazing on the eggs. 
muddy seabed this Edmund Zell is crawling across may look a bit barren, but each square meter of sediment here will contain literally thousands of individuals of tens if not hundreds of species. I have to admit, this nudibranch, Janulus cristatus, is one of my favorites. Another janulus alongside a couple of swirls of egg mass. And a close up that really doesn't do the electric blue tips justice. A purple bloody Henry and a sea pen, Virgularia. Alcyonium digitatum, known as dead men's fingers, a soft coral with each of its individual polyps clearly visible. Here, a sea squirt, probably diptosoma, but these can be tricky to identify. The solitary hydroid, Coriomorpha nutans, catches passing particles in the current, its oral tentacles passing it down to its central mouth. Purse sponge, also filter feeder. The colonial squirt and the anemone immediately grab our attention, but we miss the fish. Here he is, Poe, lurking in the background. These gelatinous finger-like capsules are squid eggs laid in a clutch and are tearing to the bottom. Alongside them you can see small tendrils which are the feeding tentacles of a buried worm. The sea pen Virgularia is a distinctive feather-shaped colonial hydroid that lives in sheltered waters. It's dependent on the current bringing of its food, but it's also susceptible to too much suspended material in the water. Colonial sea squirts like this are always worth a second look. Unfortunately, we have a particularly nasty non-native invasive that looks not dissimilar to this. Again, more tube anemones. Hermit crabs, unlike other crabs, don't have a, an armoured abdomen, so they have to protect themselves by using a shell. As they grow, they have to find another shell, and they're certainly not above evicting a, a lesser crab from its shell. A sand mason worm tube, the tube constructed by the worm sticking bits of gravel and shell together to form a robust tube, the top of which has a lacy fan work to support its feeding tentacles. A bit like driving in snow, the lights from the camera pick up the particulates in the water flowing past the sea pen. Judging the size of things on the water can be problematic, so there's some scale. You'll also see some worm tentacles disappearing under my fingers. Inedible crabs decided that there might be something to have at our shot line as the divers above do some safety stops, some decompression that just allows any onboard gas to fizz out safely before surfacing. The team's comprised of diving biologists, but also includes a marine archaeologist. And here in Frankfurt, we took the opportunity to dive a wreck that some people would know as the pins, but it's more likely to be the wreck of the Nimble. The Nimble was a 77 ton schooner and sank in 1850. Diving the site, the kelp obscures your view. You don't get a good image of what the actual wreck site looks like. However, the side scan sonar cuts through the kelp clutter and allows you to see features. Iron fittings, 
and boards can be seen quite clearly on the side scan imagery. Underwater, the timbers can still be seen, even after 170 years. Some star and a sea urchin more closely related than you might think, both the echinoderms, spiny skinned animals. The urchin would normally be present up in the kelp zones, grazing on the kelp. The seabed here has a lot of broken shell on it, mainly modiolus, and the occasional clump. You can even see a live one by the orange mantle just being prominent. A long-armed squat lobster has found a clump of modiolus to hide under. A bunch of black brittle stars have taken up residence in this empty shell, and a king's scallop has a sea urchin perched upon it. Here a native oyster. The loch once supported quite a big fishery for both native oysters and for scallops, unfortunately to the detriment of the Modiolus reef. Horse mussels are ecosystem engineers. They form small clumps. Those clumps form larger aggregations and reefs. And those biogenic reefs allow attachment of other epifaunal species, and the gaps in between provide shelter for other animals. As a result, Modiolus reefs are highly biodiverse and support a large amount of biomass, which all helps draw down carbon. So they're considered to be important in the marine blue carbon ecosystem. In order to protect the remaining Modiolus and promote recovery, several bylaws and fishing restrictions were introduced into Strangford in, in the 1990s. And there is evidence that those restrictions are having a, a positive impact with recruitment of juvenile mussels seen in some of these clumps. Of course, there's more than just biogenic reef in Strangford Loch. There's rocky reef too. Big boulders like this one, covered in faunal turf of sponges, hydroids and bryzoans, provide shelter for crabs. Here too, Polycyria nudibranchs are enjoying the faunal turf. And Mythosterius the spiny starfish, a big animal, 70 centimetres across. Black brittle stars, Ophiocamina nigra, a plenty. This lobster has excavated itself a hole under a boulder. It's powerful claws giving it defense. You'll see they're different, one for crushing, one for shredding, and they can be left or right-handed. It's not too hard to see why the Dahlia anemone got its name. Without the video lights on, everything appears that little bit green as the red light is quickly filtered away. Here, Alcyonidium, a fleshy bryozoan, quite often found attached to the tops of scallop shells. A dragonet lying motionless, trusting to its camouflage. A writhing mass of common brittle stars, Ophiatrix fragilis. Quite common in Britain and Irish waters, but not so common on a global scale. Another king scallop, Pecton maximus, with the Alcinidium on top. A velvet swimming crab squats under a rock adorned with the colonial hydroid Nematesia ramosa. Again, more brittle stars. The king scallop's mantle is fringed with sensory tentacles and little beady eyes. They help it detect predators approaching, and by opening and shutting its shell rapidly, it can swim away from harm.
Here the overlying mass of ophiroids gives way to the underlying silt clay sediment. Sometimes that can indicate that there's been some kind of physical abrasion, but that wasn't the case here. As we followed the trail, we found it was actually caused by a starfish. In this case, not the common starfish Asterius rubens is here, but the seven-armed starfish Luidia sarsi. It's a predatory starfish and predates other ophiroids and starfish. It leaves a chemical signature in its wake that the other starfish will avoid. And here's the culprit. The queen scallop, Aquapactin opercularis, like the king scallop, has sensory tentacles and eyes. The top valve here is covered in an encrusting sponge, and that's thought to offer it some protection from starfish. This orange bloody henry starfish is no threat to the queenie. It feeds on the detritus on the sediment surface as well as sponges and hydroids. The living modiolus, again it's the orange mantle evident. Another feather-like colonial hydroid, Aglophemia. And the plumose anemone, Matridium. It's many tentacles, giving it a fluffy appearance. Common starfish, Asterius rubens. And more hydroids growing on a clump of modiolus. The muddy bottom is cohesive enough to allow nethrops to excavate some quite complex burrow systems. You may call them nethrops, you may call them Dublin Bay prawns, Norwegian lobsters, scampi or longustein. It's the same animal. A little bit of persuasion from behind can make him come out. Usually they remain at the entrance to their tunnels with just their claws showing. Unfortunately for this long-armed squat lobster, it's been in a fight and lost. Another Caliostoma, a painted top shell, but this time in its painted morph alongside a batch of light bulb sea squirts. Another clump of nematesia with nudibranch egg masses. Another burrowing animal is the very distinctive angular crab, Gonoplaxus rhomboides. And here, snug inside an empty modiola shell, is a curled octopus. And alongside the distinctive gas mantle sea squirt, Corella parallelogramma. The end of the dive coming up, the lion's mane jellyfish pulses past with attendant small fish. Divers in Northern Ireland are one of the main volunteer groups participating in marine citizen science projects and are amongst the most motivated marine user groups. Citizen science provides new scientific and environmental knowledge through the involvement of members of the public and enhances the scientific research and monitoring that the department can do. Thank you. <laughs>